Hey everybody and welcome back to Movie Hell this time. I, Ryan, and my lovely co-host Joe will be discussing the 1969 masterpiece, The Computer War Tennis Shoots, starring baby Kurt Russell. Oh, uh, yeah, this was uh, this was a piece of work. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a way to put it. It's, so why did you recommend this movie to us, Ryan? I was trying to... Okay, so I think your girlfriend had pointed out that we were kind of getting off track. We started off doing movies that maybe you didn't hear of, you know, that were a little more unusual. And we were kind of getting into doing what everybody else is doing. You know, yeah, what Jeremy Johns is out. doing. Yeah, mm-hmm. we were just hitting all the new stuff, which I, I think there's a place for that here. But that shouldn't be our only focus. So I was trying to think of offbeat movies I had seen. And I thought of this one. I hadn't seen it in a really long time. I I think I found this movie originally because there's some song that samples it. I think that's how I found it. Because I was like, what is this audio from? I found a couple movies that way <laughs> from these like weird, these weird songs that just sample these little bits and pieces and whatever. But yeah, I, I, I like the movie and I kind of want to hear your perspective before I tell you why, because you texted me, you know, why did you make us watch this? And then a gif or jif, we are equal opportunity for that word here. No, we're not. It's gif of a guy dropping to his knees and yelling, (laughs) why? So tell me, why were you so uh, upset by this movie? I wasn't necessarily upset. It was, it was a serviceable, Disney, you know, old school live action Disney young adult adventure movie. Like that's kind of what you had going with it. Certainly nothing super fantastical. I think some of the things that happened in it really almost just blew my mind. Some of the stuff that they put in there. Uh, The opening, you mentioned the music in this. The very opening, it just, it feels, the music, the opening, it just feels as dated as the movie actually is. Oh yeah, it's it was so rid- good. It was so ridiculous. It's when the action starts. Just anytime oh, there's action, it's sped up just a little enough that it's kind of you know there's something wrong. Yeah, but you can't exactly put your finger on why. And the music, the terrible like '70s action music starts. Oh god, it's so good. Oh, man, yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> it I wouldn't say it was terrible. Uh, had some interesting, you know, it was an interesting concept, but. And I, I know, like I, I said, I brought up the idea that we need to do some more older movies and not just do these new releases. Then you really, you really went for it on this one. So, <laughs> what what was your take on it? You liked it. You're you were a big fan. I do like it, and I think it's okay to probably get into spoilers a little bit. I'll just I'll just talk about the the basic plot. The movie's fifty two years old, so I mean, you know, you've had well. But then again, it's so old, people haven't seen it. So just real basically, the plot of the movie is it's a private university that they're at. The student group, the main star, the main person is played by Kurt Russell. His name is Dexter. And the the school's trying to get a computer. They're trying to start classes for this. They're trying to teach students about it because they correctly predicted that computers are the future. And they end up getting one. And there's a mishap between... Dexter and the computer and Dexter takes on attributes of the computer and mayhem ensues beeping and all. Yeah. And it's kind of a, it's a fun movie. I just, it's just so goofy and weird and I really like it. And the reason I like it, I couldn't actually put my finger on it at first because I did just rewatch it, you know, even though I saw it years ago, but I had to see it again, obviously before we could do this, but I forgot by the way that Cesar Romero was in it. Mm hmm. That he played Arno, I was like, that really looks like Cesar Romero, but I didn't want to stop it to go back and look. But I actually did check IMDb before this. I was like, I'm 100 percent sure. But he looks so much older than he did in Batman. Ah, right. And I guess it's just because of his hair color and the lack of all that makeup and stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's anyway. There's a character in it, uh, Angela, who's played by Bing Russell, who's Kurt yeah. Russell's father. Yeah. I saw that too. I, I couldn't actually tell who that was in the movie though, because like uh, Cesar Romero plays the antagonist named Arno, mm-hmm. AJ Arno, and he has this like second his his little lieutenant guy who does all his stuff for him. He's he's in the movie a lot as well. I don't actually remember what that guy's name was. Did he did did they mention his name? Did they just not mention it? Did I miss it? 
Bing Russell's name? No, or are you whoever, talking about the other guy? Whoever that guy was. I don't know if that was Bing Russell. He referred to somebody else during the scene where the house is being painted. He says, uh, that guy, that little lackey of Arno, who is kind of like their, his enforcer guy, he refers to somebody as, hey, Angie. And so yeah, I assume Angelo. Angelo, that, that was, was Angelo, who yeah. he was in it for just a little tiny bit. But yeah. the one I'm referring to, I have no idea what his name was. He got sent to jail, and he was at the horse <sighs> track. He did all this stuff, but I have no idea what the character's name was because I don't know if they mentioned it one time. Uh, yeah, I don't know either. I think his name was Chili, but I'm not positive. Like like Chili Palmer? Um, yeah, no. I'm not I'm not sure what his name was, but yeah. It, some weird characters, but there was a lot of uh characterization in that not everybody was just two dimensional, which was kind of nice, kind of refreshing to see that even in a in a goofy campy movie like this. Cuz a lot of modern movies don't. They're kind of reduced to one single thing. Like the villain clearly two dimensional, you know, mustache twirling villain at Cesar Romero. Like that's what he's good at. That's what he was doing in Batman. Yeah. But, you know, the other students, they have stuff going on. There's a little bit of an arc for Dexter. And what I really like about it, so getting back to that, the the thing that I like is that it invokes the same kind of feeling that I had about computers when I was younger, in that they're interesting and evolving and changing, and there are so many possibilities. And this came about, I mean, this is not like a period piece. It came out in 1969. People didn't really know what computers were going to be. You know, they Got talk it. about home automation in this even. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a scene where Professor Quigley, great name, by the way, yep. was talking about, you know, well, here's what a computer can do that a human can do, like to replace a human. Like, imagine your mother tells you if it's raining tomorrow, you know, close the window, open the door, order this, you know, whatever. And then showed how a computer can do that. And in this room, because this room has fluorescent lights, it's part of my home automation. These lamps have Zigbee bulbs in them. That lamp is on a smart plug, and there's a Zigbee button at the door right alongside the light switches. I press it. It does a certain thing. If I double press it, it does a different thing. If I long press it, it does something else. You know, when I walk down the stairs, there's a motion sensor that turns on lights for me. If it's dark in a room, you know, there are all these different things that are predicted that it's just a normal logic thing that happens. And I really I I don't think that it's like groundbreaking in any way because of that. But I think it was back then. It was back then. And it's also. It's just fun because people didn't know, Mm -hmm. you know, like if you get shocked by a computer and it sends all this data through you, like if you're zapped by the cord, sending all the data, what happens to you? Like, obviously, the whole idea of him getting these abilities is ridiculous, but it's fun. And it's like, well, people don't know. Like, what do you like? Imagine how much more fun shows would be if you didn't know anything about cell phones or security cameras, like the zoom and enhance thing. What if you're like, oh, that could be real. Who knows? (laughs) But yeah, I just... I don't know. I like the sense of wonder sort of, you know, that it, it it's, I don't like that phrase, but it's kind of like, we don't know, you know, mm-hmm. a computer shocking you is as magical as Peter Parker getting bit by a radioactive spider. What's going to happen. I don't know. Like, let's just make a story about it. And which is, you know, which is definitely what they did. Yeah. They made a story of sorts. And the other thing, I mean, the, the rest of the movie is basically about, friendship and coming to appreciate what you already had and accepting who you are and working for, for, you know, just for what your goals are rather than having things handed to you. Yeah. When I read the synopsis of this movie, it talks about kid kids, powers of a computer and the, because he has these powers, he starts to, uh, I think it said learn about, but he, he starts to let known the gambling associations that this guy has. Mm-hmm. That that's that's kind of what the movie synopsis was. Kid gets powers and he starts blabbing about these things and then the gangster goes after him. Like, it took at least to halfway into the movie before any of that even started. Oh, no, it was, yeah, it was more than halfway through because I actually right. did check it. It was like, it's an hour and a half movie. And this is back in the day when your credits took about 35 seconds because you didn't need teams of hundreds of people in every country doing different things like and you can tell 
you can tell that they used a lot of footage from something else in this movie. <laughs> this was almost like, well, we have all this stock footage of like parades and shit. What are we going to use that for? Oh my gosh. So there's just, there's so many things in this movie that stuck out to me as extra, just comparatively, let's say they made this movie today, just as fantastical an idea to have that happen. Somebody, touches a computer or cell phone during an electric storm and gets these powers. And so all he of a falls sudden into a tub with an older non waterproof cell phone. Wait, like the <laughs> Spider-Man amazing Spider-Man two, he falls in the tub with electronics and electric eels. And now he has lightning powers like that. It's just like that. Only now you're the smartest man on the planet because your brain's like a computer. So yes. And they look like, in his, Oh man. Should we? Okay. Just go on. We, we can <laughs> talk. We can talk details and spoilers in a minute. So when this happens, uh, the professor, Professor Quigley, who may or may not be from down under. So he <laughs> he knows something is up. Uh, Dexter's taking this test. And he's talked about, the professor talked about that nobody has ever finished this test. It's a time test. And as he's flipping these pages, I'm like, there are a ton of questions in this test. How, like, yeah. how long do they give them? to finish this and he finishes it in what he's like four and a half minutes or something, something insane. He's just boom, 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 flying through it. And, and so, then loudly crumpling his papers and eating a sandwich and all this, <laughs> all this stuff that I really, really sympathize with. Cause in school it's like, well, I don't have anything to do. I guess I'll eat this apple. I brought crunch, crunch. and everybody turns and looks like inception. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There were some there were some very good moments like that throughout this movie. Some little smatterings of things that were clever or funny that it was just done well. Yeah, I or mean, like they, where where the dean is like, "Hmm, they're having their meeting and there's a little radio hidden in the plant in the middle of the table and he's, I mean, they he say can, hidden, but oh my gosh. Yeah. The way they showed it, I'm like, that is out in the open for anybody <laughs> to see. Well, okay, well. But he's like, "Hmm, every time we meet, they meet." I wonder what's going on. <laughs> like it yeah, and towards the end of the movie, he's yeah. beginning to figure it out. Oh, that was <laughs> the Dean. Oh, my gosh. So he gets these powers, and Professor notices it. He has them checked out. He goes to, like, one doctor, and that scene in and of itself is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. They're looking in his eyeball, and they're seeing circuit boards and blinky lights. They're no, looking... not even that. They're seeing the actual components of of like just images of the computer itself, like right. along the, with the blinking lights and everything else. Like yeah. they actually show the like open reel drives and the like control panel and stuff along with all, the, all the other stuff. And, and they, they did it they today. Have this device that really, I like, I just went to the dentist today and how they have this thing that comes in and it's the camera for, you have to bite on the things and it takes the x-rays. Well, it kind of looked like that, that like he had put up to the side of his head, and they can see his thoughts. I feel like that's what's going on there. Yeah. And his thoughts are th these computer images that somehow end up turning into a woman in a bikini. Yeah. It was really, like, it was weird. It and was like fun. roulette wheels and yeah. But, okay. So they figure out that this kid, there's something going on that he's got like the mind, like a computer and he is becoming the smartest man on the planet, but where it goes from there, it just, I was taken aback at how insane that was. Like they're, they immediately go from that to you're going on television in front of this panel of like, there's like a MIT professor, a Princeton professor, a Purdue, like, like whatever right, else. What I, and he's asking him these questions and he's just starts rattling off the answers. And he just, it just progresses from there. He's in a parade. He goes to Cape Canaveral. He, is doing all this stuff like he's in the I, UN, right? Oh, learning my. all the languages. Oh, it's so good. I I just is that it's I don't know. It just felt so different from how they would have portrayed that in a movie if you made that now. We have it. Limitless essentially is the same thing, but modern, right? Okay, which I never saw that. I wanted to. Oh, it's uh, a good movie. Uh, yeah, Bradley it, Cooper. Yeah, it. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's good, but it's fun. It's enjoyable. Yeah, it's definitely fun. got a lot of like ridiculous stuff going on in it like this, but it's essentially a modern version. You get yourself 
Yeah, it's actually really similar. I hadn't really thought about it until just now. It's real similar, including Probably like yeah. a gangster connection. There might have been some inspiration going on. It's possible. That's yeah. how that's how they do stuff. They're like, well, but people figure out computers, was... so let's do a uh, drug thing. Right? I, I just thought that was crazy. Where they went from him getting these powers and he just is all of a sudden swept up in this this whole new life, mm-hmm. you could say. He's extremely popular and everybody knows him. He's like a celebrity. And the school is still trying to court him to make sure he stays at that school. There's mm-hmm. a rival school, I guess a state school, who they keep referring to, uh, who gets state money, which is a big deal, even though I'm pretty sure private schools on average do better than state schools as far as making money is concerned. But I guess that that depends on the private school versus whatever state school. It just, some of that, well, a lot of this movie, it's so ridiculous, but doesn't mean it's not fun. Uh, I liked a young Kurt Russell. I mean, just like he is as throughout his entire career. He's fun to watch. He's charismatic. He goes from this kind of not a, he's not a high caliber student. No. He, although he did figure out a way of studying that I've never seen before or even imagined. Like, I yeah, thought there's the a worst reason thing for that. I think the worst, I thought the worst thing you could do. I, uh, I have both seen people do this and had somebody call me doing it driving while FaceTiming. Mm. Like, I've been driving on the highway at night and looked over and see the car next to me. Person's got their phone in yep. front of them and they're talking to somebody on video. And I had a friend of mine call me and I was like, why is it so dark? And she's like, oh, I'm driving. I was like, what? Why? Why would you call me while you're driving on video? That makes no sense at all. (laughs) It's like, call me on voice or just call me later. Because people are dumb. That's why. This guy is, he has notes taped to his windows. Yep. He has textbooks in his steering wheel. He's like, do He's like reading stuff. He's like doing little answers on the window. He's got a pen hanging from the ceiling. He's driving a dune buggy and he's driving in a storm. I don't think that's what he's driving then. I th- I, it doesn't look like that's what it's supposed to be, but I'm pretty sure. I mean, that's the car we see later. It is a car we see later, but I mean, it had a roof, he, and he's driving in like a bad thunderstorm. Yeah, trying to read and do all this stuff. Which, I mean, anybody who's been in a car at nighttime, you need light to read. Like, and, and any- you're not supposed to have lights in your car while it's night and you're driving. In any <laughs> other movie, that would have been the start of something horrible. Every time somebody's distracted, Doctor Strange, it happened. He's distracted driving. That's how his whole thing starts. Uh, the documentary film, Jack Frost, starring mm-hmm. Michael Keaton. Yep. <laughs> That's why when I actually still get nervous when I'm driving in the snow and you start getting that weird like uh, hyperspace effect when it's coming down and it's heavy and it's floating there. Cause that's what it looks like in that movie before he crashes. It does indeed. Ugh. I will say the special effects in this movie were top notch. They hold up impeccably. A hundred percent. I mean, they're practical so effects, practical effects, <laughs> his, his feet and the water on the ground, the little <laughs> rings of light around. Right, they were just, it was so good. Yep. Yeah. Oh man. One, one of my, I, the thing I thought was really funny during uh, the very first when they said they put him on TV and he's answering these questions. At one moment, he's like, could we could we hold the applause? We've already wasted 38, 38 seconds, seconds yeah. on that. If we could. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. That was so good. I really, really enjoyed the hold the applause line. That was it was just like the one you mentioned. There's a few moments in this, some really clever lines that were good. Mm hmm. I. And I still say the entire country's reaction to this one person was ridiculous. At least I, I feel it's it's that now. Because the things people get famous for now aren't anything, they're, they're not important at all. Yeah, on the way home today, I was listening to NPR. And I don't know exactly what they were talking about. But they started off discussing... And interviewing a girl who made a video on TikTok about ugly skinny jeans where she was like, three tips for skinny jeans. You know, one, like, don't wear them. Two, cut them up. Three, burn them. Something like that. And they're like talking about how she's become this sensation 
during the pandemic. That's, I was like, well, that's not anything I need to be worried about. Yeah, it, that's, it, that's what people have followers for. Yeah, the, I watched the other a video today about a guy who all he does is he is doing something innate, and then he gets up and he does this little dance. Yeah, some Asian dude. He does this little dance, and it's always the same. It's like he doesn't dance in different styles. He's like a Sims character who's dancing, but he's got <laughs> millions of <laughs> millions of followers. And then you have, you know, this girl who has learned how to play some super ridiculous hard lick on a guitar that would take you years to master. And she's got like 20,000 people or something. It, yeah. The things that people, that we as a nation are glorifying versus something that's actually, something a person has to work really, really hard to be accomplished at is insane. Well, I think it's one of those things where it's hard to do something really hard and then be like, well, and then put it out in a way where people can appreciate it. But it's really easy to be like, oh, look at that. That's funny. That guy danced. Like, look at that dance. You know what I mean? I mean, I guess it's, it's really easy to entertain a lot of people for a very short amount of time than it is to make a lot of people appreciate something I, important or impactful. The movie that I was going to have us watch, How to Lose Friends and Alienate People, mm -hmm. which is a phenomenal movie. There's a, a line in there where Simon Pegg moves to America to work for this magazine and he's explaining to his landlord, this uh, Mrs. Kowalski, who has this like fantastic accent, but she's like, you know, what you're doing? And he explains what he's doing for a living. Oh, so it's like it's like the uh, landlord in the original Spider-Man, Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie. Kind of. Yeah. OK. And he's like, uh, he's explaining, you know, I interview celebrities. I read articles about celebrities and stuff. And she's like, oh, everybody's celebrity today. You take out your breast, you're a celebrity. And he's like, I <laughs> He goes, I guess it depends on the breast. <laughs> but she's like, you know, Madame Curie, Albert Einstein, these are celebrities. And he just, Simon Pegg just goes, well, they don't make entertainers like that anymore. <laughs> yeah, I was watching, uh, I had started watching again, and I'd seen it before, but I really enjoy it. The Interview, the movie with uh, Seth Rogen and, oh my God, what's his name? I know who you're talking about. Yeah. He, I can't think he, of his name. You're talking about... um. Green Goblin son from Spider-Man yes. from the Sam Raimi Spider-Man James Franco. Yeah, James Franco. That's right. And there's a scene where they're talking about, you know, Seth Rogen's like, I want to make real news and I want to do these things that are important. And they have like a TMZ style show. That's what they give out. And, and James Franco who hosts it is like, no, well, the, the, we give the people what they want. They, they want, they want shit. We give them manja. Give us, give us more shit. Yes. Manja, manja, the shit. <laughs> like that's what, that's what people want nowadays. I mean, obviously not not our fans because this is top quality podcasting right here. We're giving them the upper echelon of you know listening enjoyment. I wish I had the it's tip top <laughs> sound clip ready for that. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be nice. Yeah, I I don't know. I don't know, dude. Some people talk about that like it's you know every generation seems to say like everything's going to shit. And if it was, we would be there by now. Right now, it kind of seems like we're there, so maybe they're right. I mean... But when it comes to entertainment, I think there's a lot of enter entertainment where there's an agenda or there's a message or something like that or something political or or maybe it's a pet project or a passion thing. Like, you get these... You know, if you have movies that are done by committee, you get something like the Theatrical Justice League. If you do mm -hmm. something where you just let the filmmaker go wild, you end up with the lighthouse. Oh, my gosh. Uh -huh. So... Yeah, I don't I don't blame anybody for like wanting to escape or have fun or whatever. You know, there's a lot of times at night where I can't sleep and I'm just scrolling through different subreddits looking for stuff. A lot of it I send to you, you know, <laughs> nothing wrong with it. But I I, I'm so I lucky. don't I don't know why the NPR is interviewing a TikToker making videos about like setting skinny jeans on fire. Maybe if I listened to it, I would have known. I mean, I did. It's possible. I kind of feel like you made the right choice in not listening to it, but <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you missed out on the the interview of the year. We don't know. And sometimes these people do some good stuff. Like there was some article that I didn't read, but my fiance read and told me about where this guy, like as a joke, put up a sign like I need more beer. Here's my like Venmo address. And people Venmoed him like tens of thousands of dollars. And he donated it all to charity except for the amount to buy one six pack of beer. Ah. 
okay. then like word got out about it and I think AB or some other beer company like matched his donation. Kind of a cool thing, you know, like nice. a goofy yeah. thing that made the news, but it's cool. So yeah. who knows? Maybe this TikToker did something like that too. Maybe she got some huge sponsorship to buy like Adidas to set pants from Nike on fire or something. And she donated that money to, <laughs> to a charity. <laughs> it's possible. Unlike then, then you've got, you know, catch me outside girl. So, so I don't think she's donating anything to charity. Is she's she, her own charity. Is she doing stuff still? Oh yeah. She's a whole music career. She, Oh yeah. You're it's, kidding me. No, I wish. Oh Lord. I wish I was. I'm not. I can't, Cash me outside, like from Maury Povich or whatever that was. Was Phil, it Phil? Doctor Phil? Was it? Oh, it was Doctor yeah, Phil? She was Doctor Phil. I blame. I was getting ready to say. I blame Doctor Phil for that. It's his fault. He gave her a platform. I, mean, I know he's just doing what he does, but are you tired of the word platform? I mean, I hate the we, word platform now. Are we talking about shoes or? No, I just I'm so tired of hearing the word platform. I just said it, and it made me angry at myself for saying platform because <laughs> so many people talk about well this is a platform for this or you can't give a platform to that yeah and it's like it has Ugh. i have heard it a lot I, I don't think i'm necessarily as tired of it as you are but now that you said it and put it that way i'm probably going to really start paying attention to it and get utterly sick of it so thanks thanks for ruining that word for me no problem it's, no problem. it's not a great word anyway what do you yeah it's not like the word moist it's not nearly as good as hey what much like iocane powder i've built up a tolerance I can handle that word now. That's good. That's good. I hope hope the rest of our listening audience can. Speaking <laughs> of our listening audience, sorry, we have tangents gone on such a tangent here, but maybe we should tangents. circle back to the actual computer who wore tennis shoes. Mm-hmm. So I have a couple points. I didn't take very many notes. There's not a lot to take notes on with I, this movie. I took more than I expected. I'll be honest. I really like some of the attention to detail. I like how when you first see arno within the first couple minutes the painting splits for whatever reason his secret door is hidden behind a painting and the painting is part of the secret door it's not yep. behind it it's not to the side of it like they made the decision like we're gonna make this and we're gonna make it right and they didn't even make it where the painting splits evenly nope they make it where the painting is a woman sitting on a chair from the side and they make it so the door pulls apart and you've got her with her butt sticking out over here and then the chair, which was under her in the painting. So that means they painted her in a seated position and then painted the chair without her and had them separate. Mm -hmm. It's so weird. It is so weird. I don't know I really what the liked, point of that would be, but I really liked it. I really like that scene in the fact that, you know, the kids have the idea that, you know, we have to try to go do this. So the school doesn't want to buy our professor this computer Maybe we can go to this guy and he can donate it. And they go to talk to him and he, he seems like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a good guy. I, I Yeah, well, let me see what I can work out. And then immediately goes from that to <laughs> <laughs> the door splits open. Yeah. It's obviously you, the music changes and you can tell, oh, oh, it's a bad guy. It's a bad guy, right? Okay, I get it. That's a bad guy. So one thing that I found really odd was the price of the computer. The guy wanted $10,000 for it. Mm -hmm. And the professor is talking about this computer was used for this thing 20 years ago. Here's this tape that this computer was used to run 20 years ago. And watch how it can still run it. And it doesn't. It fails. Which is how the part gets burned out and Kurt Russell ends up getting zapped by it and all that. Right. But I wondered, that movie came out in 69. I wonder what $10,000 is worth today. It is worth 70, nears makes no difference, $73,000. Okay. $73,000 for a 20 year old computer. I mean, that also means if that is the correct value, all we can tell that Cesar Romero was using this computer for was basically a memo pad for his gambling stuff. We don't see him do anything else with it. We just see that they're listing out their places of operation and some numbers. I don't know. I don't know if they're totals for the number of bets, the number of thousands of dollars. There's no like legend to tell you what the numbers yeah. refer to. I have no idea, but that is a $73,000 memo pad. So I thought that was <laughs> kind of in interesting. I don't know if that's accurate, but eh. they're also talking about $34 champagne at that race, which is like, mm -hmm. Oh, well that's, I mean, that's something now, you know, I'm cheap. 
and I can't taste the difference between most of that stuff. But $34 in 1969 is the equivalent of $247.41 today. That's that a, guy was being legit generous. That's with, a ball or bottle of champagne. With Dexter, yeah. So in that scene that you're talking about, he uses Dexter to call the races, and he wins a bunch of money. He takes that money, and he puts it in this leather container. Mm-hmm. It shows it for just a second, but I recognized it because I have that container. My grandpa had it, and it held binoculars. Yep, I knew exactly what that was, too. Yeah, I thought that was... I just, I'm like, I had to write that down because I'm like, oh, he's not putting his binoculars back in there. He's, there's only the exact amount of room for those in there. Yep. So he's, he's putting this, what, $28,000 or something, something ridiculous. Yeah, $28,000 in one day because he won like eight races in a row or whatever, which is the equivalent of 200, and yours makes the difference, $4,000 in today's money. And yeah, you're right. That's a good day to track. That was what I thought, too. It's like, that's a big stack of cash, and there's no room to have those binoculars in there as well. <laughs> well, if that's the stack of cash you're putting in there, these binoculars, whatever. Yeah, I'll just buy another pair. <laughs> I'll buy, buy new binoculars. Here, Lackey, you carry these. <laughs> it was... There were just fun little things in this movie. It, I, I, I had no idea what to expect. When you said the name of the movie we're going to watch, I said, oh, excuse me? What, what is this we're watching? <laughs> But just an old school kind of adventure movie, some fantastical, you know, him getting the powers. It it was just fun. Mm-hmm. And like you said, this kind of subplot in the movie of friendship and realizing what you, you don't know what you have until you don't have it anymore. And then appreciating what you had all along. Yeah, and a little bit of a spoilery thing here. So, I mean, just getting into some of the more specific details. So, that's your warning. Back out now. Mm -hmm. If you want to see this 52-year-old movie without it being spoiled. (laughs) Uh, But, yeah, I think it really comes to a point when they get arrested. They're in that illegal gambling den, and they all get arrested, and Dexter gets bailed out. And they think it's Arno doing it, and that he's leaving his lackey, and they're just... Because, hey, who cares? But it ends up being his friends. They all pulled their money and they're like, (laughs) they're like trying to pay his bail, but they're a couple bucks short. And the cop is like, look, if you promise to get out right now, I'll pay the rest myself. I'll pay the 250. And he's and he's also like looking at the the two deans have been arrested because they followed him to that party. The one from the rich state college that's going to give him like a really I don't know, good deal, free school and whatever. They're, they never explain what they're going to give him, but the idea is basically it's money versus loyalty. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know what? Like I'll, I'll sign back up. Like I'll re-enlist or uh, what is it? Re-enroll. That's mm-hmm. the term. <laughs> not, not enlist. Re-enlist. <laughs> yeah. But he's like, okay, you know, I need to be loyal to my friends. He's like, Hey, I'm really sorry that I was making out with those two chicks on TV. Like, I hope I didn't upset you too much. And I turned to my fiance during that part. Cause she watched it with me. And I was like, if I ever do that on TV, you, can you can break up with me i will expect it at that point like i'd be upset if you didn't (laughs) i mean you know but they didn't actually establish in the beginning of the movie that they were together no i guess you're right they didn't they're just establishing that that he's being weird like Uh that's not okay and it's you know to be fair when something like that happens to you when you go from regular person to overnight sensation Mm -hmm. and we're talking not just your whole town knows who you are but the entire country the world the world now knows who you are you're at the un like this is a big deal that's it's it's hard it will be hard for anybody not to change like let's be honest Mm -hmm. that's it's it's so different from everything that you've lived your whole life doing and being and now it's all it's so drastically different than everything you've done how how do most people handle that well he's also i'm not sure if this is what he's supposed to be doing but it seems like he's kind of losing his humanity just a little bit he's kind of like well i have to do like you know hanging out with you at the lake isn't important i have to do this other thing because that's important like that's the thing that logically makes more sense you know what i mean like the thing that 
when you run the numbers, the thing that's going to help me more in the long run is not the mm-hmm. connection to you. It's hanging out with this business guy or, or doing whatever. Yeah. And there's, it reminded me of a really great episode. I don't know if you've ever watched Eureka. It was a sci-fi show. It's, it was a, actually a really good show. I really liked it. It was super monster of the week, but it was different. It went places you wouldn't expect it to go. There were like really dark moments. The standout star of that show was Deacon, I think was his name. And he's played by, God, what the scientist who invents Skynet. Oh. I can't think yeah. of his name. but I don't know his name. I know exactly what you're talking he's about. He's so good in that show. But anyway, there's he an plays, episode. He plays Cyborg's dad yeah. in the Justice League. Yeah, yeah, same guy. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, anyway, there's an episode where Sheriff Carter, because your introduction is this guy who's, a marshal wanders into this town. The entire town is classified. There's the TV version of General Dynamics there. And okay. they're developing stuff for the DOD, whatever. So that's the thing with the show. Like, everything is super advanced, super high tech. There's wacky stuff going on. And Sheriff Carter, like, this marshal is offered this job as the sheriff of this town, which is an upgrade from where he was because it's super classified and whatever. But he basically uses his everyman logic to solve these problems. Like, stuff that if you were two in the weeds, you wouldn't think of. But there's an episode where they're always kind of making fun of him for not being super smart. But there's an episode where he something happens to him and he becomes extremely smart, like smarter than anybody else in the show. And he starts to lose his humanity. And it's actually a pretty good exploration into like what happens if you go strictly off logic. And I'm just wondering if maybe they took a little bit of inspiration from this as well, because it's really similar in terms of he starts thinking of stuff solely through like numbers and what's going to benefit people, what's going to benefit him, what's the most efficient thing to do. So what you're saying is never go full Vulcan. Yeah, basically. Okay. All right. There were, okay. So the kids in this, they're little regular Sherlock Holmeses. Mm-hmm. Like well, a couple at least of them a few are sitting there. Right. They, whereas the ones that at one point there's this competition, it's this encyclopedia competition. And it's just like a trivia thing for really smart kids in college. And whichever school wins that school gets a hundred grand which I guess back then is a whole lot of money. Would you like me to find out? Not really. You're gonna anyways. I know. Oh, yeah, so. I mean, you can probably see me typing $100,000 back then would be $727,667 and 57 cents. Excellent. So he obviously Dexter, the school wants him on this in this competition and the Dean gives him a list of all these other students to pick from, to be on the team with him. Like students who would probably legitimately be able to help in this competition. Not that he needed help. Right. But he, no, he wants to pick these three friends of his. And so when things inevitably go wrong and he's not able to answer questions or because of shenanigans, he's not there and they're stuck having to be there and answer these questions, they are hilariously outgunned by these other schools. Yeah. And that's actually one gripe that I have is that a lot of this was about like what you earn, not just what happens to you. And then they have this thing where it's like, well, here's a list of people who've earned their spot on this team. Mm -hmm. And then you're just going to choose these people. You know, it's, it's a problem that I'm wary of, you know, it nepotism essentially where you get whatever it is you have because of who, you know, or who you're related to or Mm -hmm. whatever, but it's not always the person who's qualified. I yeah. mean, the dean in wasn't case, wrong. Totally not. The, yeah, he's like the oh dean my God, said we, should... we have to give it to him. Like if he's not there, we we don't really have a shot. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't wrong. So the kids, a couple of them, really did some sleuthing, and they're playing over the tapes of some of the things that he said, Dexter said, and trying to figure out what things mean. And Applejack, well, that oh. Applejack, AJ, AJ Arno, and they're figuring these things out, which is kind of what you think the detectives would be doing who are now involved in this. But anyways, it's, you know, the kids, it's their adventure, so they're going to be the ones to figure it out. I did genuinely think that the idea to go and paint the house was clever. Yeah. Apart from... They just showed up, and they had somebody back at the school ready to answer and to pretend to be the painting company and yeah, yeah, it's this. It's, a, I mean, why would you call the painting company? Why wouldn't you call your boss and be like, Hey boss, did you schedule P 
people to come paint this how like what is going on no he called the painting company no nope, they they verified the boss they said it's real it's a real deal so i i at least thought that was legitimately clever that was you know a good scooby-doo like moment exactly you know? that's exactly what i thought of too yeah that was pretty good except for the color scheme nobody would have oh ever gosh. ordered that color scheme Green and then you had the orange. one kid who painted the wall wrong as like, oh you mean i was supposed to paint the house orange and the trim green oh how did i make that mistake like it killed me because why in the world are you concerned why do you care i know yeah not there was, to paint the house it was you're funny. there to look for your friend i was <laughs> thinking the same thing like they seem to actually be worried about the kind of job they're doing painting which is so funny <laughs> i love it so much that they're worried about stuff like that like yeah, it's just another one of these little things that it's like, it's just so funny that they throw that in. And I knew, I called it from the very beginning, and you just knew that it was going to it was gonna work out this way. Spoilers ahead. Uh, that Oh, eventually he's going to lose his powers. Mm-hmm. Like, and it's going to be part of this, like, he's going to have these, he's going to be super awesome. I, I figured it out when he's taking that test in the very beginning, and I'm like, oh, he's going to lose these powers, and somehow as it relates to whatever shenanigans they're going to get into. And I liked how it played out for the competition they were in. And you know, that place that you, that my aunt and she owns the paint shop there, whatever. Uh, and then the and, guy realizes, Oh wait, I can answer it. Yeah. Well, like I, it doesn't have I, to I be it. him. I, I, yeah. I've been here for 15 weeks. And I finally have an answer. <laughs> That's it. That actually reminded me of me when we go to those trivia nights sometimes because it's all <laughs> it's all music trivia. Oh my god! I'll, like if I if I know a couple of them, I'll be pretty happy. They're not they just don't usually revolve around the type of music that I know a whole lot about. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I actually uh, <laughs> I used to get invited by this group of people that I knew to go to these trivia nights, and I don't know that many answers. I don't know. Maybe I'm just fun to have around or maybe they just need another person at the table. I'm like the filler friends here. There you go. But there was this question. It was like, what car won like this number of races or championships or whatever in like the fifties. I forget exactly what it was, but I was like Hudson Hornet and all everybody at my table was like, I don't know. I don't know. And I was telling them Hudson Hornet. I'm like, well, I don't know. And I was like, okay, none of you know, and I'm telling you what it is. (laughs) <laughs> they're like, well, and they put down something else. And my answer was right, of course. And I was like, I'm not coming back. Like, I gave <laughs> you the one answer I could give you. Not You all said, I don't know. I told you I do know. And you didn't take my answer. And it's the one answer I had all night. I was here for like five hours. I had one answer. And I I stuck to it. I never went to another trivia night with them again. <laughs> nice. I remember going to a, a trivia night. And there was a question about what are fingernails something uh hair fo- what what is it made out of and my girlfriend and i knew the right answer yet the people who were part of the main group of trivia people didn't go with our answer and then the our answer came up and been like well sorry sorry about your luck <laughs> and you know it happens it is what it is yeah it just killed me nine people out of our 10 I don't know the answer. Like, I legitimately don't know. Huh, I wonder what it is. And I'm telling them. And they're like, nah, none of us have any idea at all, but we're not going to go with yours. Man, I'm still salty about it. That was like 15 years ago. That was a long time ago. (laughs) Oh, my God. But, yeah, I. Oh, that was so good. The guy stands up. He's like, I know the answer. And the guy's like, okay. You got like three seconds left to answer it. I I love that the way he loses, since you already said spoilers, the way he loses his powers is that they drop him out of a second story window in a crate the same way Emilio Estevez did in Young Guns. Yep. Right? Don't they dump him out a window in a crate? (laughs) And then he's like, he's like, Americans under, and he's like trying to force these answers out. It's like he's passing a kidney stone every time he says a word. Like, and is, there's he, a, is he there's stroking a, out? What is there, going on? Yeah, there's a point where they look like the presenter who's asking the questions. They cut over to him and he's like, oh, he's like making this weird face. <laughs> like it hurts him. Right. It was, oh my gosh. <laughs> that was, that was an interesting decision as far as I wonder if the director was like, no, no, Kurt, you need to go farther with that. Yeah, he's act like, like you're in real pain. Yeah, he was like, "Oh, do you want me to act like the tape broke?" Just like, and they're like, "No, act like it hurts." 
<laughs> the what did you think of the car chase? Pretty bad. It was so ridiculous. Pretty bad, really. Yeah. I although I noticed that when the henchman was shooting, the slide on the gun actually moved. Really? Which most of the time in most modern movies, the slide doesn't move. Hmm. And it always bothers me. There are little things that really bother me in movies and TV shows because they're so easy. The slide not moving is one of them when a gun fires. And the other one is when somebody's talking on a cell phone, like a modern mm-hmm. cell phone, and they're holding it like upside down oh or or it's clearly you can see the lock screen, like something that indicates very clearly that it's not actually on a call. Like it's so yeah, easy. Yeah. Just call like the time and temperature or a weather reporting number or you know, movie phone or th- that, that stuff is still around. Even if you don't use it, there's a lot of ways to <laughs> fake a phone call and make it look realistic or just call somebody else on the set. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's possible. You can do it. I, I thought it was what it just, I hadn't seen the car chase that ridiculous since that other really old movie. It's a mad, 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 mad world. I think that's enough mads, but that was, have you seen that? You ever saw that? No, no, I haven't. It's, a crazy, insane, adv- kind of like this adventure style movie. Uh, and there's a, a chase scene in that that's utterly, utterly ridiculous towards the very end of the movie. And it just what this reminded me of. A, it reminded me of a smaller version of that. Yeah. It also reminded me of Speed Buggy, which was kind of like, a, I don't know, when like, Scooby Doo came out. Up? No, when Scooby Doo came out, there were a bunch of other shows that kind of mimicked it a little bit, like a group of teenagers with something that talked that shouldn't. Yes, there was, there I know was, what you're talking about now. Speed Buggy was one of them. Jabberjaw was another. Jabberjaw with the shark, but Doom Buggy had a, or Speed Buggy had a Doom Buggy that talked or whatever. It was like alive, like alive and animated, not like My Mother the Car or Herbie or anything like that. Like it was. Alive, alive. Like, hey, what's up? How you doing? Alive. Yeah, I do. I absolutely remember. <laughs> I do. I know what you're talking about. That was, uh, <laughs> I hadn't thought it was, there's so many of those cartoons. Yeah, that there's a lot of them. They tried to just cash in on something that worked well, and now all these knockoffs come off. Yes. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think I'm done. I think that's all I've got to say i i like this movie a lot because it's super goofy it's super weird but it still has a decent message and it has this like sense of wonder i mean it's i'm i'm like a caveman i'm constantly fascinated by new technology like i still when i was a teenager i'm like i can't when i was like a kid i used an apple II, and a floppy disk was five and a half inches Mm -hmm. and it held i don't know how many kilobytes Oh, right. And then you have like then I had a 256 megabyte flash drive and now I have, you know, 128 gigabyte micro SD cards that are the size of my fingernail. And I'm just constantly amazed by it. And it's one of the reasons I use Android, because Apple does a lot of cool shit and I switch back and forth. But Android will do stuff like dual screens and folding phones. And I think it's Acer that has these weird computers that'll have like multiple screens. Like there's another small screen above the keyboard or something like that. Like I love these possibilities with technology and this this gives you that and it's Mm -hmm. it's just fun it brings out something childlike in me not that there's you know not a lot of that already in my daily life (laughs) (laughs) because i a lot of the stuff that i'm trying to do right now you know all these people i'm talking to and all this stuff that i'm working on right now and i occasionally have these moments where it's like i hope they don't figure out that i'm just a kid (laughs) even though i'm a real adult man I still have these feelings like I'm not and I didn't for a long time. For a long time, I felt like an adult. And then there are moments now where it's like adults don't do this. Adults don't think the things I think like, (laughs) do you know that I'm not one of you? Can you feel me? (laughs) I think I thought about that when I got my newest job and I'm working in this retirement community. And I think about how it's going to be different when people like you and I are in there Mm because we're going to be sitting in our rooms all day playing video games. Totally. Like there's. They're, all they do is sit in the room and watch TV. I mean, a, a couple of them, I will bring out books and they read, things like that. But it's just going to be different for us when we get to that point. And we're just we're, like, for any, if anybody who's listening to this is younger, you know, teenager, girl, don't, don't think you have to have the world figured out 
most adults, we don't have shit figured out. Mm -mm. We're doing what we can to be responsible, take care of what we need to take care of. But don't think that all the people who you deal with who are older than you, we have all this figured out because we don't. We're just we're just trying to get by day by day, same as everybody else. You yeah. want to figure out, make a plan. Try and try and work through it. Try and figure out what your goals are and make a plan to achieve those goals. But otherwise, you know what? I'm a, I'm a play it by ear kind of guy. Yeah, totally. I'm I'm really lucky because my girlfriend's the planner, and we're working on planning a vacation and all these things. And you and I and our girls, we're all going. And my kids, we're going camping two weekends from now. Something like, like that. a week and a half at yeah. this point. So, but I'm not. I'm not the one planning all that. Am I? Mean, I re- I'm, I'm more like the Sherpa. I just carry all the shit. That's what I do. Ah, in my relationship, neither of us are planners. So that's not good. Because I'm like, well, oh, good I should that. do this thing and just jump head first and do it. And I look to her for reason. She's like, yeah, do it. See what happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's, a, that's an adventure right there. Yeah. Life is an adventure. Go after it. Get after it. Have that adventure. Yeah. That was one of the things in... Uh, they made a Three Musketeers movie a number of years ago at this point that I would have liked to have seen turned into a franchise. I think it had Logan Lerman as D'Artagnan. I know the one you're it, talking about. I never saw it. It was really I good. I saw the like, previews really and it looked good. good but I, I really good. enjoyed it. I enjoyed the character. I liked all of it. But in the beginning, Logan Lerman, his character, D'Artagnan, is getting ready to leave, you know, to go out on his own. And his dad's like, Hey man, this is your life. Go, live, love, fight, make mistakes. Go, just whatever you do, do it with passion. Go out and do it. Live your life. I hope to be able to, you know, pass that on to my kids. Go live your life. Don't be afraid to make mistakes, to, you know, get your heart broken. Go do things. Yeah. You know, that's that's how you have experiences and, and learn and grow. Yeah, there's this author I really like, Ken Robinson, and he wrote a couple books, not that it really matters, and he's done TED Talks and stuff like that, but he has this thing that he said that I really liked where he's talking about education and its impact on creativity, and he basically just says, if you're not willing to be wrong, you're never going to come up with anything original, right? Yep. Pretty good. Yep. It's like anybody who's ever succeeded in anything, business, and uh, inventing, whatever, if you're going to be a success somehow... You've been a failure. No, nobody just succeeds and that's it. Like if you're going to succeed at something, you're going to fail at stuff first because that's how it works. <laughs> yeah, like that quote, whether it's real or not, that old Edison quote where it's like, however many failures he had, it's like, oh, you failed like 47 times to make a light bulb before this. And he's like, no, I just invented 47 ways to not make a light bulb or something yes. like that. Yeah, I don't know if it's a real quote either, but I have heard it as well. And you just... You, if it's something you want to do, you keep plugging away at it and you, you know, sort out the details later. Just, just yep. keep doing it. All right. Well, on that inspirational message, I think it's probably time to end. What do you think? All right. I'm good. I've, I've certainly talked about computers and tennis shoes as much as I can. All right. So I'll plug it just because it's what we're supposed to do. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Before you go plug in anything, is this a watch or not a watch? Oh, it's totally a watch. If you Obviously have, a watch. if you have access to it, it's on Disney plus right now. I didn't know it was a Disney movie. Like when I saw it before, I mean, I probably rented it from the library or something like that, or maybe Blockbuster. Who knows? I, it didn't have the Disney branding on it that I saw on the cover that's on Disney Plus now. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't know it was one of theirs, but it's apparently on Disney Plus right now. I'm not sure if it's available anywhere else. I don't think it is. You know, you could probably you could probably find it at your library if you have a good library system, uh, or if you're lucky maybe. enough to have a Blockbuster or a Family Video, you might be able to find it. Yeah, I'd recommend it if you have access to it. It's a pretty short movie. It's pretty fun. You know, don't go into it looking for something super deep. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think you're going to... It's not something that if you miss it, you're going to be like, oh, man, how did you miss that movie? You really need to see it. But it was fun. I can at least say it was fun. All right, so that's a watch from you too then? Yeah, that's a watch. All right, so then I'll go ahead and plug our socials that nobody uses. So we are on Twitter at MovieHell. I'm on Twitter at ManPanda. And we have an email, MovieHell at gmail.com. That's over. Nobody's going to talk to us. But that's fine. So uh, would you like some French fries with your salt, sir? <laughs> I'd like some cheese with my wine. 
All right, folks, I'm pretty sure that's it for us. I've been Joe. I have been Ryan. And we're out. Ha, ha, ha.